guys welcome back to another lecture of dental patchala where we help you understand and learn dentistry better and easy easy way and this is a expressive vision course for oral and maxillofacial surgery so if you are interested in watching more videos of this kind or if you are interested in watching in detail video of any particular topic you can check out the playlist of our channel and the link is provided in the description below for the notes of this particular video and if you are interested in reading more notes you can check out our website www.extrotooth.com so as before starting with the oral surgery make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit on the bell icon so that you don't miss any of our future videos so guys today we'll be dealing with the maxillofacial trauma so what happens when a person comes to your clinic or comes to emergency department after accident say road traf traffic accident or any fights or something so when a person has undergone any trauma or any accident so the first thing which we do is we have to see that the person has got a vital life support system so that means the first thing what we do is the abc that we will be talking about the airway breathing and the circulation so guys what happens when a person comes to your uh, clinic or hospital say uh, sometimes we say that the death is associated with the trauma so sometimes because of the accident if you have heard of stories that after accident or after some fight the person dies immediately so there are three distribution three types of distribution of the death associated with the trauma or i can say three distribution first is the first peak so guys first peak is basically when the death happens within seconds or minutes after the trauma which is usually due to laceration to the brain to the heart or to the iota or to the upper spinal cord or to the brain stem so or any large vessel see if there is any stab injury in the large vessel then also uh, the person can die because of the blood loss or hypovolemic shock so first peak distribution of the death usually occurs within some seconds or few minutes after the injury the second peak which is associated with the death after the trauma is usually within few hours so after the few few hours of injury uh, when a person has undergone the death which can be due to the central nervous system injury or can be due to the hemorrhage say blood loss so basically the period which follows the injury is what do we call the golden hour so basically this time period the golden hour guys is the time period that the person should be saved with some rapid assessment or management of the injuries so that means this is the time which we have got to save that person so the third peak which is associated with the death usually occurs in the days or the weeks so after the injury which is usually due to say some sepsis so multi organ failure or if any emboli has developed so all these can be uh, the reason for the death peak so these are the death peaks the first death peak second death peak and the third death peak which we have studied till now so guys injury can be severe injury that means we can say that the person can die within few seconds or minutes after the injury or it can be see severe injury is immediately life threatening so if we do not treat or manage it at the time itself then there are high chances that the person can die so the it can be a severe injury or it can be a urgent injury urgent injury means there is no immediate a uh, threat to the life but there can be injury to say oral orofacial structures there can be injury to the chest or to the abdomen so that should be treated but it, that is not immediate threat to the life then there are non urgent injuries also so we have talked about three type of injuries one is the urgent severe injury first one is the severe injury which is basically the life threatening right then we have talked about the urgent injuries so urgent injuries are no immediate life threatening but still we have to treat it then there are non urgent injuries so these are the injuries which are not immediately life threatening as well these are non urgent so these are not urgent injuries so guys what happens when a person come comes to uh, uh, comes to the emergency department say after the trauma or after some accident there can be the loss of consciousness so 
because the loss of the consciousness can be due to the loss of the blood say after the accident or if there is a rupture of any large vessel so because of the loss of the blood because of the circulating volume of the body is lost say if it is more than 50 percent so if a person after the accident has lost the blood which is the circulatory circulating volume or I can just write the blood then there can be the loss of consciousness so that means the person can become unconscious loss of consciousness which is associated so the first thing you do is guys when the person comes you check the Glasgow coma scale basically it is used to assess the severity of the head injury so based on the motor response based on the eye opening based on the verbal response we score it so the scoring for it is between 3 to 15 scoring if if it is at a higher side say if a person is having the score of 12 or say 15 or say 13 so if a person has got a score on the higher side that means the person is conscious that means the person is active so based on the opening based on the eye opening based on the motor response based on the verbal response we score the type of injuries so the severity of the head injuries we basically score it and based on that we have the values so and based on these values we assess that how much is the severity of the injuries so say if it is 15 that means it is normal so 15 value of 15 is quite normal then we have say the value of 13 or 14 which is kind of a mild injury mild okay let's write it down there so first of all let's see that what is the scoring so if a person is spontaneously opening the eye after any response then the score of 4 is given and if the person is opening the eye to the speech then the score of 3 is given to the pain score of 2 is given none that means the person is not opening eye at all that means the person is unconscious when it, it has come to your clinic or come to your hospital then we have we give the score of 1 then we have got the motor response that means what is the reflex that means how the muscles are active so if the person obeys or gives a good motor response that means react to whatever you say then we give a score of 6 then when a person responds uh, on the localized pain then the response is 5 when the person try to withdraws in pain then the score of 4 is given and when the person shows the flexion of extremities to the pain then the score of 3 is given when extension then 2 is given and if you say if the person is having pain and if you are palpating or if you are touching it the person is not responding at all so that means a person has come to completely unconscious there is no consciousness which is present in the person that means if even if there is an injury even if there is a swelling even if there is a fracture the person is unconscious he cannot respond to your command so that means it is given the score of one that means no response then guys we have got the verbal response that means the person is well oriented and he is responding to your commands he's he is responding to the questions which you are asking so we give a score of five then the person is confused i mean some of sometimes there there is amnesia which is associated with some injuries the person is confused you are trying to taste some taste say something but he is uh, he is trying to say uh, something different so he is not responding exactly as per your questions which are asked so if a person is in a confused state of mind we give the score of four then if the person is answering inappropriate you are asking something else he is telling something else which are not even related to each other then we give the score of three if the person is incomprehensible then we give a score of two and if the person is not responding at all then we give a score of one so guys if i say that the score of three that means all the things are none right so we give if there is a score of three to eight then that means there is a severe injury If there is a score of 9 to 12 that means there is a moderate injury if there is a score of say 13 or 14 that means the injury is very mild 
and if a score of 15 is there that means there is no impairment that means the person is quite normal so this is the glasgow coma scale which is used to access the severity of the head head injuries like the glasgow coma scale we have other scale which is we call the trauma score so that is also some scoring which we give so this trauma score we give based on the glasgow coma scale glasgow coma scale based on the respiratory rate based on the respiratory expansion based on the systolic blood pressure based on the capillary refill these are the things which we access in the trauma score like the trauma score we have guys revised trauma score as well so we have the revised version of the trauma score which we call the revised trauma score so in the revised trauma score everything are same except we do not have the capillary refill we do not have the respiratory expansion rest of the things are there in the revised trauma score so capillary refill and the respiratory expansion we do not access in that so the revised trauma score is again see if the trauma guys if the trauma score is like 12 then we say that there is less than 1% mortality rate and if the trauma score is say 0 then we say that it is more than 99% mortality rate so if the score value is very less that means the person is more prone to death like that there is the severity score also so injury severity score is also something which is exist assessed injury severity score how severe the injury is so basically the score is given in case of multiple injuries so like that we have got the scores so guys how do we manage all the traumas there are surveys right there are primary survey and then the secondary survey so primary surveys are basically which deals with the emergency then we have the secondary surveys so all the history taking and all so what are the things which we do in the primary surveys maintaining the a b and c so which is the airway breathing and circulation which will be covering in this part particular part of the video lecture so we will be checking if the person is breathing properly so airway maintenance with the cervical spine control then we check the breathing with adequate ventilation then we check the circulation and also we control the hemorrhage if there is spontaneous bleeding we have to even control that bleeding then we have the secondary survey in which we record the history so how do we remember that we remember from word ample a m p l e so a b c and ample so a is in the history we see if the person is allergic to any medicine or anything and we uh, give the medications so anticoagulants or insulin or if any cardiovascular medication then guys we take the previous history so if the person has undergone any surgery before and we check all that history so history of if any medicine history of any surgery that also we take then guys we see the timing of the last meal and e is exactly what happened so um what was what was the environment when the injury occurred so events or 
environment so basically exactly what happens at the time of injury this is what we see so the guys the first thing which we do is we check for the airway maintenance if the person is breathing properly or if there is requirement of the artificial airways or if we have to give the bag valve mask ventilation so basically if we do we need to ventilate the person do we have to go for the intubation or we have to go for the cricothyroidotomy or we have to do the tracheostomy or we have to put the laryngeal mask airway so most commonly the the thing which we do is we intubate if the person is not breathing properly due to the airway obstruction then the most important thing which we do is intubating the person we have to clear off the airways so that the person is able to breathe properly and there is no airway obstruction so if you have seen in movies or in uh, tv serials that sometimes there is any obstruction in the airway then all of a sudden a surgeon comes and he does this he um, do this sometimes they do the laryngeal uh, like cricothyroidotomy but in the hospital which we have seen is when there is a airway obstruction most of the time the procedure which is done is the intubation so basically there is an endotracheal tube if you see this we have endotracheal tube so this is a tube which is inserted deep down into the throat so that the person can breathe properly and here we give the like we give a bag so ambu bag and and later on we replace it with the ventilator so we put the person on the ventilators so this is basically a way you know the person can uh, breathe in case if there is airway obstruction so in cases if a person says in coma we can intubate it see there are two ways guys to intubate it intubate it one is to go from the mouth so this is from the mouth or also you can go from the nose there can be two ways so insert the tube through the nose down the trachea is the method of intubation using the uh, is the method of clearing the airway obstruction using the intubator using the endotracheal tube this method is what do we call the intubation so in case if there is uh, a hematoma which is expanding into the neck or in case if air is present within the tissues in case in the lower neck or say upper chest or if a person is in coma and is not breathing or in case if there is excessive trauma to the face and the patient is uh, drowning in his own blood so that is in case of what are the indications guys for intubation let's write it indications for intubation we have extensive facial trauma basically there is airway obstruction so all the things which can lead to airway obstruction are basically the indications for the intubation cricothyroidotomy then if there is obstruction airway ob i'm just going to write airway obstruction what are the leading causes to cause the airway obstruction in the lower neck and the upper chest either it can be hematoma in the neck right so all the all the things we intubate the person so guys how do we do it we have something known as a laryngoscope so this is basically an instrument which is first put in the mouth if you are using the intubation uh, using the mouth so we we there is a flashlight also in the top of this laryngoscope so we are going to retract the tongue we are going to see the vocal cords now that we know 
the path is visible everything is visible then we insert guys our endotracheal tube so we start inserting this endotracheal tube if required we can also use one more torch light i mean if we are going all right because once you enter the esophagus say suppose you are uh, say suppose you are you this is an endotracheal tube and say suppose instead of going into the trachea you somehow landed up in the esophagus then there is going to be a lot of gag reflex everything starts coming out so we also keep a vacuum suction uh, uh, in, uh, like in our endotracheal table so uh, we insert this endotrache endotracheal tube guys we reach it up to the trachea and then then we have got at the top a connector which we connect it to the ambu wall basically this is a bag in which we push the air so we if we see that everything is going fine we check here we, with the help of a stethoscope either you can use the x-ray but usually we check with the help of a stethoscope that the air is going correctly in the proper course and then guys we replace it with a ventilator so this is how we clear off the airway obstruction so the distance between the teeth and the vocal cord so we have got the distance between the teeth and the vocal cord is 12 to 15 centimeters and distance from the vocal cord to carina is 10 to 15 centimeters so carina is basically present at the base of the trachea which separates the opening of right and left main bronchi so guys in case we have unsuccessful tracheal intubation we can also go for cricothyroidotomy so cricothyroidotomy is basically we incise the cricothyroid membrane so where do we have this membrane first of all we have hyoid bone here so this is the hyoid bone then we have thyroid cartilage say we have thyroid cartilage here this is uh, let's write here thyroid cartilage then guys below that we have the cricoid cartilage right here we have the cricoid cartilage so the cricoid cartilage in between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage we have the cricothyroid membrane so this is our cricothyroid membrane this one is our cricothyroid membrane and this membrane is 2.7 millimeter wide i mean somewhere around ranges let's write the range 2.7 to 3.2 centimeters it not millimeter centimeters wide and 0.5 to 1.2 centimeters height so basically in case uh, um, i mean in which there is a severe complication in which there is unsuccessful tracheal intubation or in case where there is a oropharyngeal obstruction or in case of maxofacial trauma in basically in case where we cannot go for if we, wherein there is not tracheal intubation is not successful in that case we go for the cricothyroidotomy and it is again the th three minutes time procedure so but we do not use this cricothyroidotomy or we do not do this when there is crushed larynx 
so it is contraindicated in crushed larynx or in case child in children who are less than 11 of year of age we do not go for the cricothyroidotomy and guys if you have seen in like movies or in, in serials that sometimes um, i mean some if someone is doctor available in case of upper respiratory obstruction then somebody put a incision here and then relieve the airway obstruction so basically a tracheostomy and the intubation are the most common procedures which are used to relieve the airway obstruction so first there is a 4 to 5 centimeter incision which is made below the cricoid cartilage so if, if you can see here cricoid cartilage we go 4 to 5 centimeters below the cricoid cartilage and if you remember for cricothyroidotomy we have gone between the cricoid as well as the thyroid cartilage so the cricothyroidotomy incision was somewhere here and below the cricoid cartilage we made an incision for tracheostomy so this is the difference here is the incision which is made for which is made for the cricothyroidotomy which is between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage and this incision guys which is 4 to 5 centimeters below the cricoid cartilage is the incision given for the tracheostomy so this is the difference between the incision between both of them so in case if there is acute respiratory failure or uh, in case with a with expected need for any prolonged mechanical ventilation so basically in case of upper airway obstruction where there is difficult airway we do the tracheostomy procedure so incision into the trachea which is top or at above the fourth tracheal ring so there is a tracheostomy tube and here as you can see this is a tracheostomy this is a tracheostomy cuff or a balloon and here is where we inflate the air so guys the two most common things which we do to maintain the airway obstruction or airway maintenance is the tracheostomy and the intubation so the most common among them is the intubation second most common is the tracheostomy if there is a failed intubation we can go for the cricothyroidotomy we can go for the laryngeal mask airway also so this is basically a mask this is basically a device airway device which is supraglottic so we give above the glottis supraglottic airway device so it is basically used when there is we are doing any short procedure or wherein there is no requirement for the endotracheal intubation or in case if there is a failed intubation so in case if we want to give an elective ventilation we can go for the laryngeal mask airway so it is alternative to mask anesthesia we can say so likewise we have something known as here in the picture or the diagram we have the combi tube so it is also used for emergency settings or you can also call it the esophageal esophageal tracheal airway or esophageal tracheal double lumen airway basically this is a blind insertion airway device or blind insertion airway device so blind insertion airway device now this can be asked for a picture based question as well so like that guys we have studied all the intubations say if a person is having tmj ankylosis then the person won't be able to open the mouth then how are we going to intubate the person so the ideal method is to use a fiber 
septic intubation so basically because we know that we cannot open the mouth wide enough to see the vocal cords see guys we need to see the vocal cords so that we know that we are going into the trachea we are not going into the esophagus so in case of tm jankai losses we cannot uh, we cannot open the mouth wide as the patient is already having ankylosis so in that case we can use the flexible fiber optic intubation so there is a fiber optic camera in which we can visualize that where we are going into the intubation also we can use a video laryngoscope so we have got the laryngoscope with a video camera so we know that where we are going so basically the main objective is to relieve the airway obstruction during the trauma cases so this was about the airway obstruction next comes the b for breathing right so a for airway maintenance b for breathing c for circulation these are the three things which we have to see primarily now as the patient comes to you in the emergency after a trauma the three things which you have to look for as a part of a emergency treatment is maintaining the airway breathing and circulation so a breathing we can uh, like listen to the uh, air movements through the nostrils or if the person is not breathing properly then we can give the artificial ventilation so we have the ambu bag which we attach to the endotracheal tube and we we check with the help of a stethoscope that if the person is breathing properly so after checking it we replace it we attach it to the into uh, it to the ventilator machine so we inspect the chest wall we inspect everything we actually we undress the patient we check everything but before that the men we have to see is airway breathing and circulation so breathing we have to check for the uh, any bruising in the chest any bleeding or any flail chest all these things will be cover so we have to see if there is any tracheal uh, deviation or we have to see for the breath sounds if there is any lack of breath sound we have to auscultate the chest and we have to check the partial pressure of oxygen so we have this pulse oximetry which we attach to the finger this is an instrument if you have seen in the ventilator we have or if you have seen like during the covid times nowadays everybody has got a pulse oximeter and we have that study that in the end all as well so pulse oximetry is something which measures the atrial oxygen tension so partial pressure of oxygen which should be between 70 and 100 mm of mercury i'm sorry mm of mercury so the partial pressure of oxygen the atrial oxygen tension is we check so guys we have to check for the pneumothorax so let's talk about little bit about the pneumothorax so pneumothorax is guys pneumothorax is pneumo means air and thorax means thoracic cavity or thoracic cage so let's have a glance at the respiratory system first of all guys we have here the cavity so the upper part of the diaphragm this is the diaphragm upper part of the diaphragm is our thoracic cavity and below the diaphragm we have our abdominal cavity so in the thoracic cavity starting with the starting here we have the nasal cavity from the nostrils then we have the nasopharynx here we have the oral cavity then we have the oral cavity and here we have the uvula then both of the cavities meet at the oropharynx then we have laryngopharynx then guys down below we have here is the esophagus which is the food pipe and here is our glottis and above the glottis we have is the 
fold which is the epiglottis so which prevents the food from entering into the windpipe then we have the larynx which is the voice box so here is our larynx let's write it from l which is the voice box then guys we have the trachea which has got the rings so this is the trachea then the trachea is divided into bronchi so we have here the primary bronchi right so here is the trachea then we have the bronchi the division then we have the bronchioles like that so guys there are two lungs right so here is our lung one second so here are our lungs first one and the second one right and in between we have the mediastinum and here is where our heart lies so this is the heart so we have the both of the lungs now in between the lungs and the thoracic cavity we have the pleural fluid so this is our this is our pleural fluid so we call it the thoracic cavity right so guys in the thoracic cavity there is a pleural fluid right so if there is air entrapment here say suppose if i say that suppose say this is a knife this is a knife and somebody stabs with a knife in the chest so what happens there can be escapement of the air which can lead to the air entrapment into the thoracic cavity so based on that see this is called the pneumothorax so based on that we have three types of pneumothorax one is the open pneumothorax that means if somebody stab from a knife into the chest and takes out the knife again so there is a hole which is created see suppose these are the lungs then we have the thoracic cavity say if somebody is stabbed so what happens there is a hole which is created and when the knife is taken out then there is a hole from which the air start escaping out so this is known as the open pneumothorax right then we have the closed pneumothorax so closed pneumothorax is say say when there is a puncture to the ribs i mean uh, when the ribs get puncture into the lungs so in case of a rib fracture so closed pneumothorax is when the pleural tear is sealed when it is not open when the wound is not open so open one is due to a stab injury when there is a hole in the lungs so what happens the pleural cavity pressure becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure and once we say say suppose this trachea diameter is 3 mm right if the hole is approximately 2/3 of the trachea that means if the hole is say 2 mm so if the hole is the 2/3 of the diameter of the trachea then air start escaping out from here say air start escaping out from here so carbon dioxide oxygen so this is the release there is a release of air through this open wound from a stab injury so there is air leakage so the pleural cavity pressure becomes equal to the atmospheric pressure in this case then we have the closed one in the closed one there is no escapement of the air there is no open chamber so the pleural cavity pressure remains less than the atmospheric pressure then guys we have something known as the tension pneumothorax so tension pneumothorax is much more fatal it requires immediate emergency so what happens in the uh, tension pneumothorax say Uh, between the lungs and the rib cage a valve is created during the inspiration say say if a person is inspiring the air right oxygen air is getting filled filled into the lungs right so air is coming in but there is no expiration ex the air is not expired air is not coming out so oxygen is coming in carbon dioxide cannot go out and therefore a tension is created 
in the chest cavity therefore we this increased tension is we call it the tension pneumothorax so the pleural tear act as a ball and the valve mechanism because there because of the increase in the pressure a valve is created air gets air start filling inside the chest and uh, how we have to treat it we have to puncture the needle uh, to release the tension first and then we put the chest tube in case of tension pneumothorax so basically in case of any pneumothorax we have to put a chest tube inside the chest and in case of uh, tension pneumothorax which is usually we put the chest tube in the second intercostal space mid clavicular line in case of normal if you, if you are putting a normal chest tube say suppose uh, if or if you are doing an intercostal drainage or in case of chest tube both the cases you are incising at fourth or fifth intercostal space mid axillary line in case of tension pneumothorax since there is no expired air air is getting entrapped inside so we have to release the tension first and then we are going to put the chest tube so this is about the pneumothorax so there is one way valve through the chest in case of tension pneumothorax and also guys in case of tension pneumothorax what we see is there is a shift of the trachea and the mediastinum now imagine that these are the these are the lungs right this is the thoracic cavity now what happens say suppose if the air start filling in one side in this lung the size start increasing because there is increase in the uh, tension so the since the size is in increasing so the mediastinum is shifting to the opposite side but in case of lung collapse the shift is on the same side so this is how we differentiate between the lung collapse and the pneumothorax so the trachea and the mediastinum are um, shifted to the opposite side as the air is increased on the affected side so or in case suppose if a person is on ventilation now if a person is on ventilation the alveolar pressure is more than the atmospheric pressure so the person may develop into the peep which is the positive and expiratory pressure since the pressure is more then that can also lead to pneumothorax sometimes so if the person is on mechanical ventilation there can also be development of the peep which is the positive and expiratory pressure so if a person is on mechanical ventilation with a peep he may develop the pneumothorax this was about the when the air is uh, inside the thoracic cavity what if there is a blood inside the pleural cavity so blood in the pleural cavity is known as what is the word for the blood we call it the heme right so hemothorax that means blood in the thoracic cavity thorax so when there is a collection of the blood in the pleural cavity that should also be treated so uh, with the transfusion of the fluid or with the volume expanders so all that should be taken care of now there is something known as the flail chest what happens if a person has undergone multiple rib fracture so to understand the flail chest first of all we should know the physiology of the normal respiratory system say i'm going to cut a person halfway and i'm going to look inside what is inside it so what i found here in the thoracic cavity i see the lungs so these are the two lungs which i see i see the mediastinum i see the heart inside the mediastinum and guys we also see here is the sternum then we see the ribs ribs right these are the let's write the ribs and you will see that there are 
intercostal muscles here. So, these are the intercostal muscles. Now, during the normal inspiration, these are the intercostal muscles. And below the thoracic cavity, we have diaphragm, right? So, diaphragm. Now, what do we see during the inspiration? That means, when we inspire the air, so the lungs start expanding. How do the lungs start expanding? Due to the contraction of the diaphragm, the intercostal muscle, they start pulling the ribs. So, what happens? There is increase in the diameter. So, we can get the space for the lungs, right? So, that lungs can fill the air. So, this is how the normal inspiration mechanism works. So, during the normal inspiration, the diaphragm contracts and the intercostal muscles pull the rib cage out. The pressure in the thorax decreases below the atmospheric pressure and the air rushes through in the trachea. Now, what happens if there is a fracture in the ribs? If I say that, suppose if a person has undergone multiple rib fracture. So, what happens? Say, suppose if this rib is fractured, again this this rib is also fractured, this rib is also fractured. Now, in case if there is a rib fracture, that means in this particular area, there is not going to be any expansion. The rib cage will not be pulled out. The intercostal muscle won't be able to pull the rib cage. So, in that particular space, the lungs are not expanding. So, that means the person can undergo into the respiratory distress and the, this particular situation is what do we call the flail chest. So, basically this type of chest is seen when the person has undergone more than 3 ribs fracture. So, during the trauma, during the rib fractures, the, the, deta the ribs detach from the chest wall and during the inspiration there is shortness of breath, chest pain. How do we treat it? We first stabilize it using the external splint. So, whatever the ribs which are fractured, we splint them and then uh, we relieve uh, by using the uh, I mean, uh, by, rele by relieving the, inter we give the intercostal nerve blocks. So, that is going to block the pain from the fractured rib and the patient can breathe now deeply. So, therefore, we increase the volume of the respiration. So, that is also an emergency treatment in case we have to maintain the breathing. So, next comes the C part guys, which is the circulation. We have finished the airway breathing. Now, we have to study the circulation. Say, suppose if a person has undergone trauma, uh, if a person has undergone any road traffic accident. So, in that case, there can be lot of blood loss and we have studied that if the blood loss is more than 50 percent, then the person can even be unconscious. So, the person can undergo into the hypovolumia. That, me that means, decrease in the blood volume in the body. So, because of the hemorrhage, now it can be externally, it can be internally into the body cavities. So, what we have to do is, we have to control the bleeding. We have to control the bleeding. If there is an external hemorrhage, then we have to put the pressure on the wound. That means, if the bleeding is coming out from some external source, that means if the bleeding is coming, we have to put pressure on the wound. We have to put a firm pressure and if, suppose if there is a lot of bleeding, if you are putting dressings, then if the dressing is soaking into the blood, we should not remove it. Instead of that, we should cover it with the more, some more dressings. So, we have to keep on adding the dressings. In case if you are trying to remove the dressing, then there can be disruption of the blood clot, which can again cause more bleeding. So, we have to, we have to keep on putting the dressing, not to remove the dressings and we have to stop the external bleeding uh, from the pressure. So, from the direct pressure onto the wound. And also guys, if a person has undergone lot of blood loss, then we have to give the fluid therapy. So, if you have seen that, we give the 
normal saline. If a person is undergone into hypovolemic shock, then we give the normal saline to the patient. So, two solutions which are given in the uh, blood loss is the Ringer lactate solution. This is usually given in case if a person has come with a burn case and the normal saline solution. In case if a person is uh, having a diabetic ketoacidosis, so in that case we give a hypotonic solution. So, we have to maintain the circulation. And we have to check for the extradural uh, hematoma and subdural hemorrhage. So, first of all guys, th this is the layer of the skull. Say, this is the skull. Then we have the dura mater here. So, dura mater, how do we write? Pad, right? So, pia, arachnoid and dura. Then we have the arachnoid matter, then we have the subarachnoid space and then we have the pia matter, right. So, the dura matter, then we have the arachnoid and then we have the pia matter. So, if there is collection of blood between the skull and the outer layer of the dura matter, say we are talking about this particular area between the outer part of the skull, I mean sorry between the inner part of the skull and the outer surface of the dura matter which is basically our periosteal layer. So, in here if there is a collection of the blood, we call it the extra dural hematoma. That means extra means outside, dural uh, means dura matter, hematoma means collection of the blood. So, there is collection of the blood in the periosteal layer. This can be associated with a skull fracture or in case of trauma. Usually, this collection of blood is due to the tearing of the meningeal artery and especially the middle meningeal artery. So, also we can see uh, related to the trauma like if there is a brain injury, head injury and in the CT scans also we see subdural hemorrhage. See subdural hemorrhage as the name suggests between. So, let us just write first the subdural hemorrhage. So, subdural hemorrhage that means blood between the dura and the arachnoid. So, S D H. So, between the dura and the arachnoid, if we see that there is a collection of the blood, we call it the subdural hemorrhage. All these things we have to rule out in a CT scan. Now, we have to inspect the eye reflexes, we have to inspect so many things. So, there is a test we call it the forced duction test. Guys, this forced duction test is the eye, it is basically performed to see the movement of the eye. So, we are going to hold on to the conjunctiva, say we are going to take a forcep, grasp the forcep and hold on to the conjunctiva. So, this is a forcep, let us say and you are grabbing the conjunctiva and you are going to manually check the movement of the eyeball. So, basically check the movement of the eyeball. So, you are, uh, you are going to see if there is a mechanical restriction is present. 
So, you are going to give the anesthesia first, anesthetize the conjunctiva and then we check for the movements. And also guys, we are going to palpate, say suppose in case of a leaf foot one fracture. So, leaf foot one fracture we know that is the floating maxilla. So, uh, in the leaf foot one fracture, we see that only, I mean just below the na nasal part and the maxilla is the only part which is mobile. So, we, we palpate it. Leaf foot 2, leaf foot 3 like that all, all the fractures we are going to palpate that will cover in the individual fracture series. Also guys, we have a light reflex test. So, we are going to check for the light reflex. So, we take a flashlight, say suppose this is the face of a person, say suppose this is the face of a person these are the eyes then what we do is we take a flashlight we take a torch and you are going to put this torch torch you are going to put this flashlight into the eyes what do we see that the pupil of the eye of the both eyes they contracts in the light reflex. So, say suppose if you are checking in the right eye, this is the right then the left. If you are checking in the right eye, let us change the color guys. Say suppose this is the right, this is the left. Say suppose if you are checking in the right eye, if you are putting the flashlight, so putting the flashlight into the right eye, Right, and if there is contraction of the pupil into the right eye, we call the direct light reflex. And if you are checking, like if you are putting the light into the right eye, and if you are seeing the left eye, you are putting the flashlight into the right eye, right. But if you are checking in the left eye, so here in the left eye, if you see that there is a contraction of the pupil, we call it the indirect light reflex. So, indirect or we can say consensual light reflex. So, all these things we check guys, reflex. We also check uh, check for the bowstring test. So, what do we do in the bowstring test? You are going to, these are the, say these are the eyebrows. Then the, this is the eye. You are going to pull this eyebrows, like retract it like this. So, pull the eyelids laterally and then you palpate the tendon area to detect the movement of the fracture of this particular segment. So, like that you are going to see for the chest x-rays or in case of um, injuries in, in the maxillofacial and the neck areas. So, any asymmetry in the face, a, like asymmetries, uh, any damage in the eyelids, then you do the soft tissue examination. Uh, then you are going to see for the swelling, palpation should be done for the specific areas say uh, the supra or vital area or the zygomatic area, nasal area for the fracture of these particular areas. You are going to see any step deformity is present that all we will be covering in the say mandibular fracture we see that there is a step deformity in case of in parasymphysis, parasymphysis fracture is there because that particular segment is going to get retracted that will be covered eventually do not worry about it right now. So, what happens if there is say if this is a mandible okay. This is the anterior part, symphysis, parasymphysis. Now, this area, if there is a fracture here, this area will be pulled downward because of the genioglossus, geniohyoid muscle attachment. So, a step becomes, so there is a step deformity. All these things you should check, you should examine the neck, you should examine the spinal cord. If there is any spinal cord injury, you have to examine the abdomen. So, all these things should be examined. So, what have we studied so far is, first of all, if a person comes 
to emergency with some fracture. First thing we have to see is maintain the airway, breathing and circulation. We take the history, we take the Glasgow coma scale, we check for the uh, motor, eyes and the verbal reflexes. Then if the ABC is maintained, we check the clinical examination. We do the initial clinical examination, we palpate, we check if there is fracture of some other area. Then uh, if required, we have to go for a CT scan or if there is bleeding from any laceration that should be controlled either with a pressure or if required suture can be placed. So, we have to check for the bleeding location say if there is bleeding from ear that can be associated with the condylar fracture say if there is a bleeding from the conjunctiva that can be associated with the orbital fracture. So, all these things we should rule out. So, or if there is any perforation in the tympanic membrane that can be associated with a uh, basilar skull fracture. So, or if in case if there is a CSF rhinorrhea, so that can be due to the um, base of the skull injury to the base of the skull or if there is periorbital ecchymosis bilateral both the sides then there can be fracture to the anterior cranium base. If there is ecchymosis in the buccal fold there can be fracture to the zygoma or to the maxillary sinus or uh, if there is like all these things we should check it. The first thing guys which we need to do is like apart from maintaining the airway circulation and breathing. So, the next thing I should tell we should treat the soft tissue. So, we should remove the hematoma because otherwise there can be necrosis happening in that particular area. Then we have to inspect and palpate we have to check for ecchymosis. Uh, in any region if it is present say ecchymosis if present in the maxillary buccal fold. So, there can be association of the maxillary fracture or uh, like in case if there is a deviation there is a step deformity or occlusal deformities all these things we should check, inspect, palpate. So, we should palpate also. So, that should be done in the history taking part examination part. So, we have to examine with the help of a gloved finger if there is mobility if pre present all these things should be done and surgery is usually avoided till there is a, a sub subside of the swelling which usually at least takes one week of time. So, uh, after the soft tissue swelling is subsided then we go for the surgical part that we will be covering in the next part of the video. So, how do we do it? Either we go for open reduction or we go for close reduction that will be continued in the next part of this express revision course of the oral surgery. So, if you have enjoyed this video give it a thumbs up also comment in the comment section below because this motivates me to put more videos for you and the notes of this particular video will be provided in the link in the description box below. You can also support me on Paytm as well as on PayPal to make more free videos for you guys. So, till then keep reading, keep learning, stay motivated. I will see you soon in the next video.